Okay, so I think um, we can start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so we have Dr. Shea today from UCLA um, at the France Foundation um, talking to us today about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so Dr. Shea received his MD, PhD at John Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine. Uh, he did his internship at Yale New Haven Hospital and his neurology residency at Stanford University Medical Center. He completed his uh, neuro, um, clinical neurophysiology fellowship at Mass General Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, his career then took him to UCLA, where he served as program director of the Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship, as well as the director of the Neuromuscular Program. Um, and he's still acting professor of neurology and pediatrics there. Um, he has done a lot of research in neuromuscular disorders, such as uh, SMA, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, um, which he will be talking to us about today. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Shea. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And um, so today I was, I'll, I'll be talking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy and I'll be focusing on what's, what's happening in gene therapy, which I think is gene therapy is sort of a hot topic uh, in, in genetic diseases. It's kind of a hot topic in neuromuscular diseases. And I think it's gonna be emerging as a hot topic, I think in genetic neuro, neurological diseases in general. So you're gonna start seeing like the genetic epilepsies, um, you know, as they're starting to develop uh, gene therapies, maybe some of the movement disorders as well. So I think this is really quite interesting and applicable in general. So these are learning objectives. I'm gonna talk about Duchenne, what it is. I'm gonna talk about gene therapy, um, the components of gene therapy, talking about the promoter transgene and vectors, highlighting that and, and what to pay attention to there. And its effect on expression, function, and, and safety as well for when you're um, administering that to patients. And in particular, we've been gonna be talking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy today. Um, and, and then we'll talk about how to evaluate whether gene therapy is working, um, and then looking at its, its clinical effects is, you know, whether it's working or not, safety and efficacy. This, uh, this is a presentation that's provided by the France Foundation. Um, they, uh, they created the slides um, and they actually had input from Dr. Crystal Proud and me in forming these slides. These are, uh, this is certified for CME credit as well. So it's fair and balanced. And it is an educational activity that's supported with a uh, non-restricted educational grant. Um, from Sarepta Therapeutics. So I'm gonna start by telling a story. And this is a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I'm gonna just take you through sort of different phases of his life. Um, we're gonna start with when he presented and, and, and how he was diagnosed. So at the time of presentation and diagnosis, he was six years of age. Uh, he was presenting to the neurology clinic and the kindergarten teacher basically noticed that he was not keeping up with his peers when playing. And, discussed this concern with his mother. And mom noticed that he was not going up and down the stairs right. He was basically taking one step at a time, not alternating. And he doesn't jump and he trips and falls occasionally. And he does have some learning challenges, particularly with reading. And mom also notices that he requires redirection and he has some in, inattention and impulsivity. So, so exam did show and large calves, and they were kind of firm to palpation. The arms were anti-gravity in full range, uh, and he had some mild hip girdle weakness. And when he was rising from a seated position on the ground, he had to turn around um, and assume a widened base and then uh, push off one knee to be able to get all the way up. So he 
He, when he attempts to jump, um, he can attempt to jump, but he doesn't really get any air beneath his feet. Um, and he's a subtle waddle. It says the host muted me. Okay. <laughs> I've unmuted myself. Um, he has a subtle waddle with mild lumbar lordosis and some excessive um, um, arm swing when he's walking. And he holds the handrail when ascending and descending stairs. And he's, his reflexes are diminished. So his CK is found to be profound, profoundly elevated at 25,000. And genetic testing reveals that he has a deletion in a portion of this gene. So this is a very large gene. Um, and we'll talk about these exons. There are 79 exons in this gene. So as you may recall, exons are portions of the gene which then get spliced together and then they form this continuous messenger RNA. Um, and this, upon confirming his diagnosis, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, he was then started on a steroid. And the steroid, one of the steroids we commonly use is really only FDA approved for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's called deflazacor. You can also use prednisone. And so he establishes care in a multidisciplinary clinic. And he's seen by neurologists, he's seen by rehab doctors, um, some therapists, physical therapists in particular. And we usually have a pulmonary specialist and a cardiac uh, cardiologist as well that follows our patients. And, and they do need some significant resources. So we have social worker, um, genetic counselor, and dietitian, and, and somebody who helps with education as well. So fast forward to 15 years of age, he's lost ambulation by this time. He lost ambulation at 12 and a half years of age. He uses a power wheelchair for mobility. He can feed himself. Um, so he's able to get his arms um, raise his arms or raise his hands up to his face to be able to get food to his mouth. And he can reach over his head and can put, his sh put on a shirt independently, but he's not fully independent. He requires assistance with dressing and toileting and bathing. And so on exam, he raises his arms, anti-gravity full range. His shoulder does seem to be a little bit weak. He sits independently when transferring um, to a, an exam table. He has profound lower extremity weakness at the hip girdle. He cannot walk or stand. Uh, and his pulmonary function shows that he has uh, a forced vital capacity of 85% of what would be predicted for his size. And cardiac evaluation, evaluation shows that he has an ejection fraction of about 55%, you know, a little bit on the low end of normal. So now we fast forward to 22 years of age. He now uses a full a power wheelchair for mobility, and he's able to use move his hands and his fingers to some extent. But he now requires a more sensitive joystick to be able to to navigate, to be able to move the uh, power wheelchair around. Uh, he can no longer feed himself because he can't get his uh, hands up to his face. Um, so somebody has to feed him. Uh, so he does have some preserved hand. Uh, movement, but video games, which is his main source of uh, passing time, um, has become more challenging uh, because he's having difficulty with the controller. And his pulmonary function has now shown that his forced vital capacity for his size uh, has diminished to about 45% of predicted. He requires um, nocturnal non-invasive ventilation and his cardiac evaluation shows uh, mild but further deterioration of his ejection fraction at 50%. So this tells a story of perhaps a prototypical uh, patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I think, you know, sometimes um, when you hear about it, and I think that was perhaps the case when I was a trainee, um, uh, is, is that you, you tend to hear sort of the beginning of the story. Perhaps what you don't hear so much um, is the end of the story. Um, and, you know, eventually this, this young man is, is going to pass away of this disease, um, likely due to complications of respiratory failure or cardiac uh, failure. And, you know, typical age of death is in their 20s. And, um, and there are a lot of details in there. And what we're really trying to do is support them as, as well as we can. And so I think you can get a sense of that. Um, so let's talk about Duchenne muscular dystrophy in general. It has an incidence. I think recent data suggests that it's closer to about one in 5,000 male births. Um, it's, so it's pretty rare. Um, it is a fatal neuromuscular disease and it is X-linked. Typically, we start to notice 
symptoms when they're about three, four, five years of age. By the time they're diagnosed, you know, the parents will often say in retrospect, they noticed something was wrong. And in fact, they went to ask the pediatrician, the pediatrician would even sometimes say, well, this every kid develops at their own pace. Um, and so let's just see how he does, maybe get him some physical therapy. So sometimes you hear that story where the diagnosis is delayed. Um, and they very frequently uh, lose ambulation, come off their feet by about 11 years of age and they require the use of a wheelchair. Um, during adolescence, you see further deterioration of skeletal muscle, but you also see cardiac muscle and respiratory muscle deterioration. And that leads to the serious life-threatening complications that we often see. So this is a cartoon that shows dystrophin. The dystrophin protein is here in purple, okay? And what you can see here is this is the, the muscle cell, the inside the muscle fiber, the outside the muscle fiber is up here. Um, so this is the extracellular matrix. So inside the cell um, is where the dystrophin resides and it associates itself with the cell membrane. So there are a whole bunch of proteins here um, and it kind of anchors the dystrophin, the dystrophin is actually seeming to anchor um, what's inside over here that's attached to the other end, um, which is the actin filament. So the actin filaments are part of the cytoskeleton that leads to the contraction of the muscles. So it anchors these uh, contractile elements to the membrane. And it, some people say it forms sort of a shock absorber type of effect. And that probably for the most part is true. There may be some controversy behind that, but, but it helps to maintain the structural integrity of the muscle. Um, and without it, what happens is as the patient uses his muscle through time, the muscles start to degenerate. You start to get a loss of muscle. Say, so the most amount, amount of muscle that they're gonna have in terms of number of muscle fibers or muscle cells is, is when they're very young and they start to, they start to lose that with time. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is now some of the genetics behind it. And I show here the genetic code. The genetic code, as many of you remember um, from school is the, you know, comprised of these nucleotide sequences and nucleoside sequences. And so these base sequences form three letter words that which then map into amino acids. And so um, you, know, you have transfer RNAs, which basically um, take the genetic code from the messenger RNA and then makes a protein. And it elongates one amino acid at a time. And so there are 20 amino acids here and there are actually three stop codons as well. And so you know, what I'd like to emphasize here is there's something that people in genetics talk about that's called the reading frame. And the reading frame means that when you have a code that's comprised of three letter words, and, and this is literally perhaps a representation of that, except it's in English, you know, not in a genetic code, um, you have to read from the correct code, meaning that you have to go three at a time and you go one, two, three, 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 and you get a message. And, you know, when we read a book, there are spaces to parse out the words for us. Um, but in, in the case of genetics, it's just a continuous string. So it's very easy for, you know, the, the ribosome and the transfer RNA to sort of shift perhaps, um, you know, by one letter through two, three, one, two, three, one, and, and get a gib, you know, some gibberish shifted code. Or you can even shift one more letter, three, one, two, three, one, two, and you get this, you know, another um, shifted code, which is, which doesn't represent anything. And so this is just to show you that, you know, when you get a reading frame shift, that, that, that will present problems. And, um, this doesn't mean anything. It actually does mean something in genetics, but it means absolutely nothing related to the original intention. And so what's shown here is one representation of the exons within the gene of the, of the dystrophin gene. There's 79 exons, as I told you a little bit later. And you'll notice these shapes here, these squares and perhaps you know these chevrons and, and other things that here. And what they're really trying to map here is the reading frame. That's, and the reading frame here is important because a lot of patients will have mutations where whole exons are deleted. It's actually a fairly common thing. 60% of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy have a number of exons which are deleted. And if you delete exons where the reading frame is shifted, and that's one way to look at it if you were missing, for instance, that boy that I presented earlier, he was missing exons 49 and 50. 
And so what these shapes mean is that 48 does not fit with 51. 48 does not fit with 51. You know, and you were talking about that because 48 would splice to 51. That would shift the reading frame downstream from here. And as, as a result, you get gibberish here. Um, and, and it'll truncate the protein. And then this protein in a truncated form is unstable and then it just disappears, it becomes degraded. And so, so that's what we're gonna see. And this is a protein, this is another representation of the previous cartoon that shows um, this, this shock absorber dystrophin protein that's binding, that's to act in on one end and binds to the membrane on the other end. And so, what you see here is in the normal individual who does not have any muscular dystrophy, it makes the full protein because everything is there and there are no mutations. You can have different kinds of mutations. For instance, you can have a mutation like the boy I presented earlier who is missing a number of exons. In this case, this is an example of a boy who's missing exons 47 through 50. And so as a result, everything has dropped out here. 46 is now splicing to 51. And what these shapes are representing here is that, that the reading frame is then shifted and you're gonna start hitting some stop codons. And so this, this protein will then be truncated um, and it's gonna disappear. It's certainly gonna be non-functional. It's probably gonna be truncated and then unstable and then become degraded. So this is a patient who's not gonna make really any dystrophin and as a result, this patient's gonna have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Another way that you can have a mutation, which is actually a little less common, is you can have point mutations. For instance, a nonsense mutation. A nonsense is really not a good word. I don't know why the geneticist came up with this word. It just means that there's a stop code on here. It has nothing to do with you know, it being nonsense. Um, but it will also truncate this protein, and as a result, it'll be unstable. Uh, but this is in contrast to Becker muscular dystrophy. So I'm sure you've all heard of Becker muscular dystrophy, um, which is a milder form of muscular dystrophy. But it's a result, it's, you know, a result of mutations within the same gene. And this is an example where a patient here is missing exons 46 through 54 as a result, 45 and splices to 55. Um, but in this case, the reading frame is preserved. And as a result, um, you know, you still have critical elements on, on one end of the protein, critical elements on the other end of the protein. If you recall in the previous slide, there are all these repeats in the middle. And the idea here is there's some redundancy and that perhaps that if you lose a few of these repeats, this, this protein could still be functional. And so this, this patient is a, a lot milder because this protein is, is not un, as unstable and then is actually serving some function. Um, perhaps, you know, really not as good as, as the original dystrophin protein, but it's, it's, it will actually do something that will actually allow this patient to be milder, have some skeletal muscle function and, and have a longer longevity in, in most cases. So what we're going to focus on today is gene therapy um, and gene therapy for use in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I show here the term in vivo. In vivo refers to gene therapy where we're injecting the gene therapy directly into the patient. So this is in contrast to ex vivo. I will not be describing ex vivo in any detail today. I'll just briefly state that ex vivo is uh, when you apply the gene therapy to cells in culture outside the patient. So you're not injecting it into the patient directly. Um, and so you probably know about ex vivo gene therapy. You've heard of CAR T cell therapy. This is, you know, this so they're, you're, they're harvesting hematopoietic bone marrow cells, treating them um, ex vivo in a culture and then transplanting it back into the patient. So that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is directly injecting the gene therapy into the patient. And in particular, we're gonna be talking about injecting it intravenously. So it's basically systemic administration of gene therapy. And most commonly, uh, in contrast to ex vivo the gene therapy where they use retroviruses, um, adeno-associated virus is the type of virus um, that's, that's being re-engineered uh, to be able to do this. And so this is the adeno-associated virus. Um, the capsid here is actually what's being used. Adeno-associated virus in its, in its true wild form 
um, has its own genes. It has some replication genes and some capsid genes. Um, it's a non-enveloped virus and it's not associated with any human disease and it doesn't seem to have much immunogenicity. Um, but what we're talking about here for gene therapy is to re-engineer this so that it, you, it has the same capsid, but instead the, the genes that it contains are no longer the wild type AAV genome, but instead perhaps something that has some therapeutic benefit for the patient. And so this is what's shown here. The transgene is basically the gene that you're trying to replace in gene transfer therapy. So this is what we call the DNA cassette. It has some critical elements that I'll be talking about in a, in a minute. Um, but very importantly, AAV doesn't seem to have, have any association with human disease. And that's in part because it also has low immunogenicity and a favorable uh, side effect profile. Um, some of you may know about the history of gene therapy. In 1990, there was actually a very well-known clinical trial patient. His name was Jesse Gelsinger, and he was participating in gene therapy clinical trial, and he died um, because uh, after it being administered gene therapy um, of a systemic inflammatory reaction. And what was used in that um, clinical trial was adenovirus which is a different virus than the adeno-associated virus. So I want to emphasize that uh, this is a much smaller virus, which does not have the immunogenicity that adenovirus does. Um, so it's a lot smaller. And one important fact is that the wild type genome is about five kilobases and the transgene capacity is about 4.7 kilobases. So in other words, we're using this as a vehicle to deliver a gene and the payload capacity is about 4.7 kilobases. And that's a very important number that we'll be talking about in a second. Um, one important difference between ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy is in ex vivo gene, um, gene therapy, they're using retroviruses, which integrate into the host um, chromosomal DNA. Um, and what that means is that these hematopoietic stem cells, when they divide the DNA that has been provided to the patient by the gene therapy will also be replicated. So that is not true for in vivo gene therapy. The, uh, the transgene that's deliver, delivered actually exists in the patient's cells as an episome and does not replicate. As a result, the transgene could be lost um, with cell division or, or tissue turnover. So just a little bit more about this DNA cassette. We, um, this is inside the vector. And so there are a few components here. There's the promoter, which is basically some regulatory elements, which turns on the gene. It has tissue specificity. And it determines what tissues um, the transgene will be expressed in. And then the transgene itself is basically the gene we're trying to replace. So some, many of you are probably familiar with gene therapy with for spinal muscular atrophy. In that case, we were trying to replace the uh, SMN gene. And so what was here was the SMN gene for, for the spinal muscular atrophy uh, product. And then the vector itself sort of has its preferences um, as to what tissues it would like to transduce. And, and, and this is transduction, basically the vector finds its way into the cell, into the nucleus, the DNA escapes and then it has to form a second strand because this is a single stranded DNA and then it'll start replicating. Um, it exists again, separate from the chromosome as an episome and therefore it doesn't have any replication points. It doesn't actually um, copy itself when the cell is trying to divide, no centromeres. This is a um, study that was published. It's uh, done in mice. So I, I do want to emphasize that, but I think you do, can learn some things about it. And each of these bars represents a different serotype of AAB. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and this is a logarithmic scale, just to point that out. And these are different tissues. So you can see heart, lung, liver, kidney, testes, brain, and gastrocnemius. So if you're interested in a muscle disease, for instance, you may want to focus on muscle. This is actually where the DNA is ending up. And if you look at protein expression, this is how much of the protein they can find in there. So if you're interested in muscle disease, you would want to focus on perhaps 
you know, the, the, the serotypes that have bars that are higher in the muscle groups. And for, so in this case, you can see AAV9 seems to hit the muscle pretty well um, if you assay the DNA or if you look at the protein. Um, and heart is also muscle, and we're interested in the heart because it's, you know, as I explained to you earlier, Duchenne muscular dystrophy does cause cardiomyopathy. So we would like to also target the heart. And again, AAV9 also hits the heart pretty well. Um, if you're interested in other neurological diseases that affect the central nervous system, you would want to focus perhaps in what looks where expression in the brain would be a little bit more prominent. And I would point out that spinal muscular atrophy is a central nervous system disease because the motor neurons reside in the spinal cord. And so in that case, um, you would want to focus on, on serotypes that actually do target that. And, and they actually selected AAV9 for the spinal muscular atrophy gene therapy. And that's that bar over here. So a little bit more about AAV9, uh, AAV in particular, it's, um, again, it has a payload capacity of 4.7 kilobases, but the dystrophin gene is too large. The cDNA is 14 kilobases. You can't fit this into this vector, okay? But what was found, Pretty early on, this is a paper in Nature uh, in 1990, and Kay Davies reported that they found a patient who was 61 years old and walking. And at that time, they were they realized Becker muscular dystrophy was also caused by mutations in the same gene. So they said this is a pretty mild Becker patient, but his mutation was was, was that he was missing a pretty large section of this gene. So if you show this graphically, the whole gene here. This is what was missing. Everything from here all the way to here, that's 46% of the gene was missing. So he had this portion, he had that portion, but he was missing everything in between. And so the lesson learned here was that you don't need the whole dystrophin gene for you to, to be, you know, to be, um, to be able to survive, you know, to 61 and ambulate. Um, so, so what that means is this miniaturized dystrophin, in this case, they called it a mini dystrophin, does have partial function that the dystrophin gene has because it has the critical elements here on one end and the other end, these connect to the important uh, proteins it needs to connect to. So, so perhaps what we can do is make mi miniaturized dystrophins that are small enough to be able to package into, into AAV. So in contrast to SMA, where they could actually fit the whole gene into AEV, there's no way we could do that for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So uh, the idea is to make miniaturized versions of dystrophin that are actually small enough to be able to fit into AEV. And this led to a whole set of experiments. A lot of these were done at the University of Washington by a scientist named Jeff Chamberlain. And he basically created all these different DNA versions of miniaturized versions of, of, of dystrophin and he introduced them back into a mouse that has muscular dystrophy, they call it the MBX mouse. Um, and then he went through and tested these mice, you know, on rotor rods, which are basically, you know, treadmills for mice um, and all these other things that you can do with mice. And also looked at it histologically to see which ones had the most um, preserved muscle architecture. And, and there are a number of these which actually turned out to be pretty good. And that's what we're seeing here is currently these are the clinical trials that are recruiting patients um, using gene therapy, using different versions of gene therapy. So they all have uh, different promoters, for instance. This is basically the tissue specific regulatory elements. The transgene itself is a little different. They've picked mi different miniaturized versions of dystrophin. And I'm sure they all have some pretty um, you know, pretty good function. Otherwise, they wouldn't have picked it, at least in, based on the animal models they have. Um, and they all sort of have their favorite vector. Two of them actually picked AAV9, one picked AAV8, and one actually uh, picked this uh, rhesus, this rhesus macaque. This is a non-human private. It's a monkey virus, basically. Um, so, and, and they have their reasons for picking this. And they have, this is the name that they've given to each of these uh, drugs, as we're going to call it, gene therapy drugs. So these are all being um, studied. 
And basically the data they're collecting is, of course, safety. It's important to look at safety, but to see if it's actually benefiting the boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, I'm gonna talk about in a second. This is probably the one assessment that we're using for Duchenne muscular dystrophy boys. I'm not, my intention is not to teach you all about the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, but at least for you to actually feel comfortable as I show data for it. Um, but time function tests, like how long it takes for them to climb up four steps or climb down a few steps, um, run down the hall, get up from the floor and so forth. And those are all standardized and as well as pulmonary function tests. And then you can look at biomarkers, like for instance, how much protein is found in the muscle. These patients are all getting muscle biopsies. You can homogenize the muscle and run it on gel and see if how much protein is there or do mass spec. Or you can do histological staining with antibodies to do immunofluorescence to see how much um, intensity you see there. Or you can look at the DNA, like how much the vector cassettes or vector genomes are, are ending up into the patient's muscle tissue. And we usually normalize that to how many nuclei they have. So we say how many vector genomes per nucleus and a good rough number you usually, I would assume wanna see is about two because Usually each nucleus has a diploid, has two genes. And so if you have about two per nucleus, that's probably pretty good. This is the North Star Ambulatory Assessment. Once again, I'm not trying to teach you all about it, um, but you know, we're testing the patient's ability to stand, walk, you know, jump, hop, hop on one foot, for instance. This is increasing difficulty. There's 17 items here. It's a scale of zero to two for each item. So they get a maximum score of, of um, 34. Once again, this is an increasing difficulty. And over here on the right is basically this pretty uh, recently published study that looks at the natural history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So they basically took hundreds of patients with um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and each of these lines represents a boy's curve and how they scored on this assessment. And the average of all these patients is, is shown here in this dark line. So this gives you a little idea of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy tend to follow something along this curve, but you can also see the cloud or the scatter. And you'll, we'll come back to this because I'm gonna show you what the data for the clinical trials are starting to look like compared to this graph. So these are the, um, these are the clinical trials that are currently enrolling. And I show here those four products these are the sponsors, these are the names of the company, Sarepta, Solid Biosciences, Pfizer, everyone's heard of Pfizer by now, um, and then Genethon. Um, and Sarepta has done three clinical trials, they've completed two of them. This is the most recent clinical trial using commercial grade manufacturing. Solid has done one clinical trial, Pfizer has actually currently running two clinical trials. Um, and then the Genethon recently started just a few, so five, six months ago, um, dosing their first patient. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on the data from these three clinical trials. Um, I'll just to uh, show you what's going on. Endeavor, um, Ignite DMD, as well as the Pfizer phase one clinical trial. There's not enough data to describe for this one, and I don't have any data for this one either. So first, we're going to focus on Endeavor. And Endeavor is the third clinical trial that Sarepta is running. Um, and this is their design. They're recruiting three different cohorts, kind of a young cohort, um, a slightly older cohort, and then an older non-ambulatory cohort. So they really try to get a little idea of, of um, what this gene therapy is doing for the muscles of these patients. So it's very focused on muscle biopsies. They get a muscle biopsy at baseline. They get a muscle biopsy 12 weeks later. And they also collect some clinical you know, assessments looking at clinical efficacy. These patients undergo a single intravenous infusion of this gene therapy. And so they had to have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, had to be genetically proven. They couldn't have antibodies against the vector because that would, you know, then they'd be immune and so that the treatment wouldn't work. And, and they couldn't be too severely affected. So these are ranges of the North Star ambulatory assessment for the first two cohorts. The third cohort, they, they were looking for non-ambulatory, so it's a little bit more severely affected. And they wanted to exclude patients who had uh, bad cardiac disease or bad pulmonary disease. So the primary thing that they were looking for was what does the muscle biopsy look like? How much protein is in there? You know, quantify it 
either based on Western blot or, or to look at the immunofluorescence. They also wanted to look at safety measures and then vector shedding, but they were also collecting some exploratory outcome measures. I don't, this data is not yet complete, so I won't be showing this. Um, so there are three cohorts. Uh, we'll be talking about the first 11 patients. These are their ages. And again, looking specifically at what was in the muscle, muscle biopsy, so how much DNA was ending up in there, how much protein was ending up there by Western blot, how much protein was showing up on the histology, so by immunofluorescence, and as well as capturing safety. So this is the data, okay? So if you look at the DNA content, the transgene was not there at baseline, and it showed up to almost four, 3.9 vector genomes per nucleus. So I told you two is pretty good, so four is better than two. Um, um, if you look at the protein, um, once again, this is by Western blot, we're homo hom homogenizing them the muscle biopsies and saying running it out on a gel and seeing how much how the intensity of that band you can see that at baseline there was nothing and that 12 weeks there was you know um it says 55.4 percent so 100 percent is how much let's say you and me might have um since assuming we don't have any muscular dystrophy and so so you know that's about more than half the amount of dystrophy that perhaps i might have in my muscles and then looking at perhaps on histological section, so you can see what this looks like. This is a muscle biopsy cut and cross section. This is stained with a different protein, just showing the outline of the muscle fibers. And this is at baseline. This is 12 weeks later. And you can see there's no dystrophin staining in this patient at baseline. And there's a good amount of dystrophin staining. This is actually one particular robust uh, patient who had a good response. Most of the muscle fibers here are staining. You know, there's one perhaps over here that's not staining and here and here, but I would say about 80, 90% of the muscle fibers are staining here. And so this is the data across all the patients you can see at baseline, there may have been some muscle fibers which are staining. We call those revertent fibers. I won't go into what that means, but basically patients do make a little bit of dystrophin here and there. Um, but after... Um, 12 weeks after treatment, you can see the number of dystrophin um, staining fibers. So that's what PD, um, PF means, percent dystrophin positive fibers, uh, goes up to about 70%, and that's a change of 57%. Um, if you just look at the intensity of this, uh, this red um, section, you can also do that, and you can see there's, there's an obvious change in the intensity in the red between these two. So this is what they observed in their study. And this is just to summarize the numbers. These are the numbers I, numbers I just talked about. Um, and there were, they had a previous study. And this, you can see that they're fairly similar to the previous study that was conducted. And now in terms of safety, the most common adverse, adverse uh, event was vomiting. There's actually quite a lot of vomiting and nausea after you get gene therapy. That's actually true across all gene therapies. Um, not every patient has it, but a lot of patients do have it. Um, there was some increased liver enzymes, so transaminases. Um, transaminases are elevated in Duchenne muscular dystrophy because it's also a muscle enzyme, but they're, they became a lot more elevated. And we have other um, liver enzymes, which are liver specific and not just muscles, you know, not, not found in the muscle. Um, there, they, this was responsive to steroids. It's thought that this is a inflammatory reaction that we see, we see, and that's why we pre-treat with steroids and continue to treat with steroids. So we see this, we've seen this across uh, different gene therapies as well. So the, there were two serious adverse events, um, one that had marked elevations and transaminases that was responsive to steroids, and there was one that had not severe nausea and vomiting. Um, there are no clinically relevant complement activations. So what we mean by complement here is the immune system complement that can actually lead to certain effects. And I'm gonna be talking about that because it's gonna, in, in a couple of the other clinical trials I'm gonna be talking about is they did see complement activation. So in a summary, the Endeavor study, the first study I'm describing today, showed robust transduction. It had robust expression of protein with localization to the membrane. It had a consistent safety profile. 
Um, and this is their first clinical trial where they're using what they call commercial grade uh, manufacturing. And this showed that the clinical, uh, the commercial grade uh, process was very similar to what they had used in the previous clinical trial, which was basically just um, um, gene therapy that was grown in, in, a, in an academic lab. Now I'm gonna move on to the solid biosciences um, program. And this is a complicated slide. I don't really want to go through all this. What I just want to highlight is the fact that they had a lower dose and then they had a higher dose. Uh, they had three in the lower dose group and they had three in the higher dose. There's actually been two more, uh, but we don't have data for the additional two. I'll be highlighting the data from the patients, three patients in the higher dose. And what they were also interested in was fairly similar. They were looking at how much dystrophin the, the transgene dystrophin, so the microdystrophin, that's why we call it microdystrophin, because it's a miniaturized version of dystrophin. How much was ending up in the muscle as measured either by Western blot or perhaps some of the other ones, um, looking at safety. And then there, we do actually have some clinical effic efficacy data that I can show you in a second. So this is what was seen. This is patient four, five, and six, the three patients. You can look here, this is at much lower magnification, but you can see the outline of the muscle fibers here. And you can see that perhaps approximately 10 to 20% of the muscle fibers are staining positive. So there are a lot of fibers here that are not popping up. These two patients actually had closer to 50 to 70% positive muscle fibers. So there's a lot more you know, ovals in here representing those muscle fibers that are cut in cross-section. And you can see that um, this is just one particular patient at baseline compared to, <clears throat> to day 90 of treatment. You can see this change um, no staining at baseline, and then they're staining um, after 90 days, 90 days after treatment. Um, dystrophin interacts with other proteins. I think I showed that cartoon earlier where there are a few proteins in the mes muscle membrane. One of them is actually beta sarcoglycan, and that interaction is stabilized. So when they don't make dystrophin, then very little beta sarcoglycan is actually found. Um, but once this patient started making microdystrophin, it did stabilize that interaction. And then so the beta cyclopalacan is present. And this is another protein called NNOS, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, which also interacts with microdystrophin. And what you can see is by increasing microdystrophin, these other proteins are also stabilized, which is partly why it works, um, why, why dystrophin uh, works. So what I'm showing here is again, this the scatter um, plot that I showed earlier with uh, the natural history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but overlaid on here are a few lines um, in purple here, you can see is uh, a couple of low dose patients. And then in blue here, a couple of high dose patients. This is at two different time points. So this is after one year, this is at the most recent visit. And you can see these five patients represented here are kind of moving in trajectories, which I wouldn't say it's 100% convincing yet, but it does seem to suggest that it may be deviating from what most of the boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy are doing. So you can see the trajectories don't seem to be at least going down this curve. But you see there's a lot of variability also, it will probably require a little more time there's a lot of variability in the natural history. So, you know, I think a little more time would help us to feel a little more confident that this is really deviating from this, from this cloud. Um, there are only five patients here because one of the lower dose patients actually was not ambulatory. So he could not perform this assessment. And you, in contrast, there are a couple of patients who are in the control group that seem to be a little bit more in line with the natural history shown here. And this is a similar type of plot, but with a different thing. This is the distance that's walked in six minutes. So the scatter plot's a little different, um, showing the natural history and the average curve. And you can see that these five patients, once again, in purple and blue, you know, for the most part, appear to be deviating from this natural history too. And this is pulmonary function test. You can see that the lower dose and high dose patients, for the most part, seem to be stable or perhaps even improving. This is in contrast to the control patients that appear to be declining. However, with regard to safety events, I talked about complement activation. So complement, as, as you recall, forms that mem membrane attack complex. 
um, which is supposed to poke holes into bacteria and other microbes. Um, well, it can actually cause an autoimmune type of reaction. For instance, thrombotic microangiopathy or also known as um, hemolytic uremia syndrome. If it's complement activated, we call this atypical hemolytic uremia syndrome. And this is what was seen in a couple of patients. There was a platelet count drop, uh, there was hemolysis, and there was evidence of complement activation. And these are two different press releases that came from this study. Um, so these are the uh, safety data. There's nausea, vomiting, and then the complement activation in two patients that's been seen. So finally, I'm gonna cover the Pfizer study. Um, the Pfizer study, you know, again, a little bit of a complicated um, protocol, but basically they had three muscle biopsies, first muscle biopsies before they got the drug, then they got the drug, then they got a second muscle biopsy two months later, and then a year later, they had a third muscle biopsy. Um, and so they were interested in very similar things, how much protein is found in the muscle, uh, but also they collected some data on whether there was any functional benefit. So there are three sites in the study. Um, 19 patients to date have been um, recruited into the study. They did have some safety events similar to what was seen in the solid study. There was complement activation leading to acute kidney injury and this hemolytic uremia syndrome with platelet drops. You can treat these with echolizumab, which um, many of you may be familiar. This is something that you can use to, to treat um, you know, myasthenia gravis, um, similar types of drugs can be used to treat, um, to treat that NMO, for instance. Um, so it's a complement inhibitor. Um, and in this case, it, it was used for these patients. It was also used in the previous study. So two patients in this study so far. But what you can see here is this is quantification of the protein. This is the three biopsies for the patients who were in the lower dose. You can see they, there was a nice robust increase in the amount of protein that was found by mass spec. In the higher dose, there was an even more significant increase. Yes. It's down. Hmm? All these things that you put in there. Huh? Are you talking to me? down. Okay, maybe not talking to me. Um, so this is the increase in the protein um, that's uh, found by, by mass spec. Um, and then you can see the, if you look at the histological staining the, by immunofluorescence, there's also um, an increase in the number of fibers that are staining positive. This is the lower dose and this is the higher dose showing that up to about 50% of the muscle fibers were staining. And this is just to show you representative samples of the higher dose, up to 50% were staining, very similar to what I showed earlier, no staining at baseline, an increase in the number of fibers which are staining. And this is the functional data showing that the patients um, in the lower dose which are shown here in blue and the higher dose are in red. And, you know, um, maybe not so much this blue patient, but then maybe the other five seem to be reasonably on a trajectory that appears to be deviating from that natural history of what you would expect patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy to have. So they're not declining apparently as much as what you would expect in, um, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is another way of looking at the same data. It's called the bootstrap method. I'm not gonna go through this, but basically it's a, it's a, a way of looking at this data to see what, um, if it deviates from what you would expect. But let me talk a little bit more about safety. Um, there have been um, studies in other disease states um, that where gene therapy is being used. Um, this is a study that I'm actually involved in as well, uh, myotubular myopathy. And we've actually now had four deaths in this study um, due to um, fulminant um, cholestatic liver failure. And it appears in part to be due to uh, liver disease that these patients have, which we didn't realize um, my tubular patients have, so we're now paying more attention to it. Uh, but the patients who don't have liver disease seem to do very well, but the patients who do have liver disease have not been doing well. Um, and liver, subacute liver failure has been reported in spinal muscular atrophy, um, thrombotic microangiopathy or atypical HUS is not something that's specific to these Duchenne studies. They're seeing it in spinal muscular atrophy as well. 
and not not in very high frequency, but there have been you know over five cases I think that have been reported in the SMA um, space. Um, and then this is just a study out of Nationwide Children's Hospital where they looked at SMA uh, gene therapy and some of the safety signals that they've seen. So th this is all sort of coming out a little bit more, more than we initially appreciated when we started doing gene therapy. Uh, and this is a study actually in primates. So these are, these are monkeys that were treated with a gene therapy. Um, and they actually had some loss of sensory ganglion. So the dorsal root ganglion or inflammation. And so that's something that we're also paying attention. So a lot of these things are just sort of a collection of things that we weren't perhaps as aware of, but now as we're starting to do studies and starting to treat patients, uh, we're starting to get a better sense of the, the safety. And just to talk a little bit more about the immune system and safety, you know, um, one of the things we think about is this is the time, the x-axis here is actually time and this red time is this when gene therapy is given. And in the immediate period, so this is within the first week or two, you can get the innate immune system attack activating. So the complement uh, mediated thrombotic myocardiopathy, that tends to happen within the first week or two, or sometimes what we call atypical HUS. And we don't really know what are the factors that, why are the patients who get TMA, why do they get them? And why are the patients who don't get them? Why do they not get them? Some people have talked about capsid dose, um, but that's not clear if the number of capsids we're infusing is actually the main issue. And then there's adaptive immune uh, immunity. This is T cell mediated responses. And this is largely responsible for the liver stuff we're seeing, some of the um, AST and ALT elevations that happen a little bit later on. This is about three to four weeks out after gene therapy. And this is in part why we're giving high doses of steroids sometimes or, or even pre-treating and continuing with steroids. Um, so steroids do seem to attenuate this and it may be some inflammatory reaction that's happening in the liver. Now, when we think about Duchenne, I, I went through that timeline, this boy, you know, early ambulatory phase when he was around the time he was diagnosed, there can be some reasonable expectations for preventing loss of motor function, like keeping him ambulating, keeping him standing, keeping him breathing, you know, maintaining his cardiac function. Um, but I think what you're seeing here is the, the non-ambulatory function or non-ambulatory patients. I mean, what are, what do they have to expect? You know, I don't think it's realistic to say that they're going to start ambulating, um, but they are, you know, feeding is a very important thing. Um, if you can feed yourself, it's a huge uh, issue of independence. You can't feed yourself. You're relying on the other people to, to, to be able to do that. And respiratory function is also very important. Um, so if, you know, these patients are hoping for stability so that they can maintain what they have, maintain cardiac function, respiratory function, and motor function. And even in the late ambulatory phase, you might say, well, there's so little muscle to save, you know, does it even make sense to give gene therapy? You know, I mean, that's debatable, but, you know, if you talk to the patient who says my only level of independence is being able to operate this very sensitive joystick so that I can get around and I can type you know, because I'm going to school and, you know, I'm, that's all they have in life. And so, you know, and different types of expectations, but it's, uh, you know, they're trying to prevent going on a full-time ventilator and they're trying to preserve whatever cardiac function they have as well. So in summary, there are now four clinical trial programs for gene therapy systemically administered using miniaturized versions of the gene uh, because the gene is too large to be, to be packaged into an AAV vector. And these are actively recruiting patients. Um, data from the muscle biopsies. And so, you know, we don't have long-term data, but we have some data. Uh, most of the most interesting data that we can present are from the muscle biopsy that shows that there's pretty robust uh, protein expression of the miniaturized dystrophin proteins. Um, and so that, I think that is promising. There's also clinical data, which it's a little too early to say with absolute conclusive, um, um, uh, definitive conclusions, but I think what you can see is that there seems to be some deviation from the natural history of DMD. I think with time, we'll be able to see uh, what these trajectories look like. However, as I've also described, there's innate and adaptive immune systems, which are not specific to Duchenne. Um, it's probably something we're going to be dealing with with systemically administered gene therapy. Um, and they have created safety signals, 
including atypical HUS or thrombotic microangiopathy, as well as liver function um, abnormalities. And so I think we're very cautious, but cautiously optimistic about gene therapy in general, and certainly gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And with that, that concludes uh, my talk. I think I, we have a little bit of time. I'm happy to take questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shea, for such a wonderful talk. Um, knowing uh, two young boys uh, growing up with Duchenne muscular dystrophy that had the very typical course, you know, that's very exciting for our patients in the future to have uh, hopefully different outcomes. Um, so any questions from our audience? Hello, good morning. Hi. Hi, hi, Dr. Shea. Uh, I am Aparna Pariyadit. I am an international medical graduate and currently applying for adult neurology this year. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the session. It was deeply informative. Um, so I have a quick question. So I would want to know your thoughts on exon skipping and using drugs like uh, ATEP uh, Lursin for, you know, uh, DMD. Uh, do you think it's comparable to gene therapy? So no, um, exon skipping is not comparable to gene therapy. In its current form, ateplersin, golodersin, viltilarsin, um, I think um, casimersin, these are the exon skipping therapies which are approved and available. Uh, these are designed um, to correct the reading frame to make um, you know, internally deleted uh, versions of dystrophin um, that are partially functional. They're not comparable because of how much dystrophin is made. Um, it's the best thing that we have now that's approved, um, but the amount of dystrophin that's made from exon skipping is more in the neighborhood of, you know, one to 5%. Whereas the data I presented today, I think you can see is, is, is a bit more robust, you know, with protein expression of microdystrophin anywhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 50%. So I think that these are very different types of numbers. It doesn't mean that um, exon skipping doesn't have any benefit. It doesn't, it's, I think it does benefit patients. I've seen patients who are definitely deviating from the natural history. It's just that, you know, I think when you see these numbers, they're much more promising even than what we're seeing with exon skipping. I will also add though, that there are newer exon skipping chemistries, which may have higher efficiency. So there's like either antibody conjugated or protein conjugated um, antisense oligonucleotides, which may have a more robust effect on exon skipping and give more protein expression. And there are a few companies which are trying to develop these types of drugs, which would be basically improvements from the current exon skipping drugs. All right, thank you so much, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so there is a question from the chat from Dr. Lidden. Um, he asks, will there be ways to re-engineer the capsid to be more specific to muscle? And will there be any ways to get bigger payloads? So yeah, great question. I mean, re-engineering virus Capsids is certainly something that's being looked into right now. There's a lot of talks about it. Um, I, I'm not able to share, I'm not even knowledgeable enough to share exactly the specifics of the re-engineering. I just know that that's very um, actively uh, a, an area of interest. I think for a lot of those efforts, though, it may be actually to try to see if it can improve the safety profile. Um, however, re-engineering the capsids so they have larger payload capacity is is not something I've heard about. I think that that would really change the structure of the, of the capsid completely. So, so if you change a few amino acids in the, in the capsids, that might change the immunogenicity, but I don't think it's not, a, not as easy to say, let's make it bigger. Has there been any use of CRISPR uh, to, uh, they're, they're huge genes, but uh, what about replacing them with uh, uh, no, relatively normal dystrophins with CRISPR? So CRISPR is for um, gene editing. 
Um, yeah. So uh, CRISPR, yeah, I mean, it's CRISPR is feasible. So the strategies with CRISPR, however, however, also are limited because most of our patients have deletions and CRISPR can't bring back what's already deleted. Um, so if you had point mutations and you wanted to re-engineer um, something so you can correct something, um, that's probably more what CRISPR would be able to do. Um, but for most of our patients, um, gene editing to correct the defect is, is, is going to be, is not going to be possible. However, they have found that, you know, and it, the name of the game is to make smaller versions of dystrophin um, that are perhaps just almost as functional. And, and one of the CRISPR strategies that's been talked about is to actually cut out more of the dystrophin gene, make it in frame so that they have a miniaturized version of dystrophin. And um, so not giving them a microdystrophin, but converting the patient's own dystrophin into to a miniaturized version of dystrophin by cutting out more of it. Um, and that, that's reasonably feasible. They're doing that in animals. I, I don't think they've started doing that in humans yet. And it's pretty well known that there are patients who have mild muscular dystrophy who are missing, for instance, exons 45 through 55, um, which is a hot spot for deletions, like 80% of the deletions uh, we see in, in Duchenne are actually in this region. So if you just cut out a little bit more, um, then they might have a milder uh, muscular dystrophy. Thank you. <laughs> Another question, what is the cause of the liver dysfunction and how do you manage it? So the liver function for, um, for gene therapy in general um, is probably the capsids that are you know, the liver tends to take everything. So you, you give in, you give gene therapy to the patient and, you know, more than half of the gene therapy ends up in the liver. So the liver takes a huge load. This is true in SMA. This is true in everything. Um, and, and the capsid, when it's hits the liver, um, it's, it's a new antigen. The patient's never seen it before. Um, and then there's an immune, immunological response against the capsid. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we believe is happening, but you can attenuate that uh, that type of immunologic or inflammatory response by giving the patient steroids. So lifelong steroids? No, no. You can tape. You just taper them off the steroids. For so it's easier to explain this in SMA because they aren't on steroids in general. Uh, you put them on steroids for a few months, you're tapering them all over a few months. But in Duchenne, we actually treat them with steroids for their disease, and so. So we put them on higher doses of steroids temporarily, then we move them back to their original dose of steroids after about a few months. Thank you. I, I have a quick question. Um, I know that diagnosis before, before the age of four is, is unusual, uh, but are there thoughts of trying the, the gene therapy for, for younger kids? Yeah, I mean, there's an ongoing discussion and debate about that because, you know, I think it's very easy to think about um, treating early in a, in a disease like spinal muscular atrophy because motor neurons don't divide as far as we know. And so if you treat a baby, you know, they already have all the motor neurons they'll ever have um, as far as we know. Um, but in muscle, it's a little different. So if you treat too early, the problem might actually be that you'll eventually get some dilutional effect. I mean, the patient, the baby is going to grow, you know, um, and the their their muscle mass is going to go grow significantly too. So you're treating, you know, a, a twenty. Let's say you're treating a ten kilo baby, and then eventually that ten kilo baby is going to grow to a 70, 60, 70 kilo um, young man, and um, but the amount of gene therapy you're using is weight based, and so you know even if you don't have transgene loss, I mean that's that's how you're you know that you're you're treating with a lot less gene therapy. Um, so so there probably is a sweet spot um, in terms of treating because you may want to treat at a somewhat older age, you know, like three or four years of age or five years of age. Um, so there's a debate as to how early you want to go. Early always sounds better, but then you have to consider growth considerations. Got it. Thank you. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Shea, again for such a wonderful talk. Um, there's, uh, I think, no more. One more question from the chat was, um, have they considered multiple administrations of the engineered virus? Yes. Yes, that's a great question. Um, we don't know how long this is going to last for. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I, I don't even know if I can guess, you know, how, if, if there is a significant benefit, is it going to last 10 years? Is it going to last 20 years, five years? You know, what's the half-life, let's say, of the, of, the, of the cassette or the transgene in the patient? Um, um, we're probably going to have to do muscle biopsies on these patients, you know, 10 years down the line and, and see how much of the protein, how much of the transgene is still left in their muscles uh, to be able to answer that question. Um, because tissue turnover is just too hard to predict. So, so the answer is, I don't know the answer and I don't think anybody does. All right, so thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you again, Dr. Shea. And everyone have a good weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Shea.